Welcome to Mysteries and Mimosas. My name is Max Sterling, and I'm here with your co-host and my better half, Arya Sterling. Hi, everyone. Hi, Arya. So today's case is from 1993. It's the very first episode that we ever recorded. But before we get started, I want to run you through some 1993 trivia because that's when this case took place. And the reason I like to, or we like to do the trivia um, for the year that the incident happened is to bring our listeners back to that time period. Um, and what better way than to try to help you think about where you were and what was going on during that time. 1993 trivia. Are you ready? I'm ready. Which of these popular kids' toys were released in 1993? A. Furby. B. Beanie Babies. C. The Littlest Pet Shop. Or D. Tickle Me Elmo. I'm going to say Beanie Babies. Yeah, you would be correct. You do get a point that means nothing. How proud of you. <laughs> it means something to me. How proud of you I am. <laughs> it means something. What does it mean to you? I don't know. I'm always proud of myself when I get an answer right. <laughs> okay. Okay, well then question number two. Which lightly carbonated alcohol beverage was released in 1993? Izzy? Or it's not Izzy. What is it called? What did called? you call it? What is it That's called? That's not an alcohol beverage. I know. Those are the things you get at Starbucks. Dang it. Hold on. I, I can picture it in my mind. I mean, 1993 was not even close to drinking alcohol. So, but I know what it... Hold on. What does it start with? A Z. Yeah. Um, that's where the Izzy came from. Uh -huh. um, I'm surprised you even came close. I know. I, I've heard of this. Hold on. Oh, I, I can't remember. Is it Zima? Zima, yes. Yes, it is yes. Zima. <laughs> I knew yeah, it released had in 1993, in good year. Okay. Okay, uh, question number three. Which of these movies was not released in 1993? Mrs. Doubtfire, Schindler's List, Jurassic Park, or Toy Story? Toy Story. Okay. Do you know what year Toy Story was released? 1995. Right. 1995. Yeah. Yep, you're right. Mrs. Doubtfire, Schindler's List, and Jurassic Park were all released in 1993. And if you get this one right, you get a bonus point. Which one was the top grossing movie of 93? Out it's of in the, there. Out of those ones? Um, Schindler's you're, List. Wrong. Okay, hold on, hold on. If it's not oh, Schindler's... Well. Oh, okay. Well, Go if ahead. it's not Jurassic Park, then. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to guess that first, but... But you didn't, didn't, so you don't get the bonus question. Bonus point, not awarded. Hmm. You lose. So what did I get? Two? Two well, points? I'm not done yet. Oh, there's more. Okay. Question number four. Give me, I know you know this is coming, the top year-end song from the Billboard 100. 1993. Ooh. As usual, I have the top five pulled up, and if you get one of those, I'll give you the point. Hmm. 1993. Um, is one by the Spin Doctors? No. Nope. Oh man. Spin Doctors is <laughs> not even close. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought it was popular in All 1993. Right. Thank you. The number one song is. It's oh yeah. Of what? course. Whitney Houston. What's the name of the song? Um. I would only. I will always really? love you. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, wow. You're a pretty big Whitney Houston fan. You almost yeah. didn't get it. Enough of that. All right. Number two. Whoop, there it is. Bye. Um, the uh, tag, tag team? Yep. Yeah. Good job. Can't help falling in love by... UB40. Good job. Oh, you're on a roll. Yeah. Maybe I'll re give you a redemption point. I know. I just needed a little help. Two more. That's the way love goes by. Oh, you may have just stumped me. I, I spoke too soon. What does it start with? A J. Hmm. Janet Jackson. Janet Jackson. Yeah. Oh, you always know it, but you don't know it. I know. I and then number five is "Freak Me." I don't think you'll get this one. You're no. not into that kind of music. No. Silk. No. I don't. Even, I don't even know what it is. You know what? We'll look. No, I can already tell you that's enough of that. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> How is that hey, even in the not, top five? It's horrible. It's not my style. Like Apparently, it. it was a lot of other people's style. 
Yeah, to make it in the <laughs> top five. Okay, here's the final bonus question. Do you care to guess the most popular TV show in 1993? I don't think you'll ever get this, but... No? No. It's not like Home Improvement. Or... Oh, that's the number two. Oh, home I Improvement was the number two, yeah. What does it start with? Oh, if I tell you that, that's easy. It Is starts it with a six. Oh. 60 Minutes? You're right. It is 60 Minutes. Huh. What other show would start with a six, oh, right? That's true. Okay, let's get started. But before we do, visit us on our website at mysteriesandmimosas.net, where you will find additional information about our episodes. You can also follow us on Instagram at Mysteries and Mimosas Podcast. And of course, please do us a big favor. Click subscribe and share our show. I'm excited about this one because I don't know anything about it. That's this right. This is something that you found and researched all on your own. So this is the first time I'm hearing it as well. And I deliberately kept you in the dark because I really want to take you through this journey as we take our listeners through this journey. Let's start with the victim, right? That's what we should always do. Start with the victim. Um, today we're talking about 20-year-old native Alaskan woman from Pitkus Point, Alaska. Her name is Sophie Sergi. Um, Sophie Sergi was described by her friends and her family as a very smart, hardworking, but very shy uh, 20-year-old college kid. Um, apparently, Sophie was very straight-laced, never into drinking, avoided doing drugs. She had a lot of friends. She had a very good social uh, circle, but she just wasn't into that nightlife of partying like, you know, most college kids. Also, she was pretty petite, kind of almost your size. She was only five foot tall about um, 111 pounds. So what happened to Sophie? Well, Sophie was a student at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. That's when actually it, UAF. Sorry, when was this? When, when well, you just can't wait, can I you? I can't. Are you going to get into that? Am I jumping it. the gun? I'm just going to try to That's okay. sit here and listen. Like I was saying, she was a student at University of Alaska, Fairbanks, UAF. And on April 26th of 1993, she was found murdered in one of the dormitory bathrooms. The crazy thing about this story, though, is Sophie wasn't attending classes at the university at the time of her murder. She actually took some time off school because um, she had some, well, like I, like I had mentioned, she's a very hard worker, so she had some dental work that she wanted to do. So her orthodontist was in Fairbanks, but she took time off, um, she started in 1992, but she took time off in 93 to work, make some extra money, um, have, uh, you know, some insurance to help pay for, I guess, this overbite that she had that she wanted corrected. When this happened on Saturday, April 24th, 1993, uh, she had an orthodontist appointment, which was scheduled for that Monday morning of the 26th. Okay. So she flew into, um, Fairbanks. She left Pitka Point on Friday, the 23rd, flew into Bethel, Alaska. From Bethel, sounds like she had a little layover, um, went to Anchorage, where she spent the night with a family friend before flying to Fairbanks the next day. Okay? So she was then scheduled to fly back home on that Monday the 26th after her orthodontist appointment. While Sophie was in Fairbanks, she stayed with her friend Shirley Wasuli, who was a student at the university. She lived there. She still, you know, was attending school and everything. And that so was a she, friend that she knew from before. She lived in the dorms. In the dorms, okay. yeah. In fact, she lived in the dormitory called Bartlett Hall in room 227. So the second floor of Bartlett Hall, like most dorms, they have different, you know, floors that are specifically for men or for women. Um, the entire second floor of Bartlett Hall was only for women. Okay. Okay. So... Anyway, um, according to court documents, Sophie spent Saturday running errands in Fairbanks, and on Saturday night, she returned to the campus and hung out with her friends. And that'll kind of be revealed a little bit later, which friends and what was kind of happening. So Sophie spent the day on Sunday hanging around Bartlett Hall. Sunday evening, she and three other friends went to a movie, and after the movie, she and her friends drove to a place called Murphy Dome Recreation Area. Murphy Dome Recreation Area is a popular area to view the Northern Lights. It has a lot of ATV trails, hiking trails, things of that nature, and it's only about 20 miles outside of Fairbanks. If you research this online, 
Um, one of the la- actually the last picture taken of Sophie was at Murphy Dome Recreation Area, where she was kind of spinning around outside, and um, her friend snapped a picture of her, and that was the last picture that was ever taken. Did you put that picture up on our I website? Did so we can. So, um, after she leaves, sometime around midnight, Sophie's friend dropped her off at Bartlett Hall, where she met up with Shirley and Shirley's uh, boyfriend, Noah Naylor. Sophie left, Shirley, uh, Sophie left Shirley's room, went to the common area to get a drink, and when she returned, she only stayed for a few minutes before leaving again to go smoke a cigarette. When she was on her way outside uh, or walking out of uh, Shirley's room, Shirley stopped her and said, hey, you know, it's cold outside, but if you go into this bathroom, um, the east bathroom on the second floor of Bartlett Hall, there's a, a tub room in there where there's a bathtub apparently, and you can, there's like an exhaust vent inside the bathroom. So you can go over to the tub and smoke inside and you won't get caught basically. And then you can stay warm, right? Okay. So this bathroom, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. It, it's, uh, all my research shows that it's, it's like a tub room inside of a larger bathroom. The larger bathroom has these shower stalls and this tub room has its own light, but it's, it's kind of separated from the rest of the showers with uh, like a swinging door. Okay. Right, like a shower door, kind of. Okay. About 1.30 a.m. on the 26th, Shirley and Noah go to Noah's room, which is in a different dorm. They spend the night there. And the reason that they wanted to do that was to allow Sophie to come in and sleep in Shirley's bed, and she was just going to stay the night with uh, Noah. So because she wasn't back from smoking her cigarette yet, they left a note on the door telling her where, sh- where they were. At about 8.50 in the morning, Shirley came back to her dorm room, found the note where she left it. Sophie wasn't there. In fact, Shirley reported that her room was like in the same condition as it was when she left. The TV was on, so it kind of appeared that Sophie never came back to the dorm room. Um, Later that day, she called the orthodontist because she was worried, and uh, you know, Sophie never even showed up for her appointment, which was the whole reason that she showed up to Fairbanks anyway. Right. She took a flight, made arrangements, and then she never went to the appointment. Right. This is the crazy thing about this. So she leaves about, you know, one thirty in the morning or whatever, um, you know, kind of early in the morning after hanging out. Um, you know, her and, and um, Shirley and Noah just hung out before she left for her cigarette, just eating pizza and talking and stuff. And then 8.50 in the morning, she comes back, doesn't notice her. Well, it wasn't until 2.42, uh, university janitors were cleaning the women's bathroom on the east side, second floor, where she told her to go smoke her cigarette, where they discovered the dead body of a young woman laying in the bathtub, the same tub that Shirley told Sophie to go smoke in. So Shirley had never apparently had never gone in the bathroom or looked for Sophie anywhere else in the dormitory, just her room? As far as I could tell, nobody ever looked for her. I mean, you know, the the last time she was seen was early hours of that Monday morning, and then she wasn't discovered till almost 3 o'clock the next afternoon. Yeah, now, I remember, seems... I don't know what it looks like inside that bathroom, but, That's you true. know, there's shower stalls, and then there's a door um, that leads to the bathtub room, and... I'm, I'm guessing not a lot of college kids want to just take a bath. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. My first college had a had a had a tub. It had a, a lot of showers in the shared bathroom, but it did have one room where there was a tub. Okay. So I don't. Did know. Did you ever use it? No. No. <laughs> no. Why would? But you, it was right? there. It's I, weird. I don't know. I guess. And I mean, I don't even know if that bathtub, the swinging door into the bathtub room, even locked. Like what? You know. I just, I find it weird. I would probably never, I don't take a bath at home. I take showers, but I definitely wouldn't be taking a public bath in a bath. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. I'm um, I'm just curious because just Shirley was so concerned that she even called the orthodontist's office to see if she made her appointment, but yet she didn't look around the the dormitory. I mean, I, I probably would have just gone the last place I knew she was, which was the bathroom. So, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess she didn't she didn't think to go to the bathroom. I mean, she sent her there, but maybe, you know, in the morning she might not have been thinking, oh, I sent her to the bathroom. She might have only been thinking, well, she went out to smoke. Maybe she didn't even go there. I don't know. Okay. I mean, that's a really good question that somebody probably did ask her. We just, I just don't have that information. So 
After the body was found, police and medical first responders were called, and then ev- and eventually the investigators showed up to you know, conduct the investigation. Police immediately started to canvas Bartlett Hall. Um, from what I can tell, this is kind of in a, in a, April is in a time frame where like students are leaving to go home and coming in. They don't know if they're staying. So they're really trying to interview hundreds of people because this is a multi-level dormitory with a lot of students. So they're probably scrambling, trying to get everybody interviewed as, as quickly as possible. And that's a daunting task when you have to interview hundreds of people because you're going to miss something. You know, it's going to be there, but you're going to miss it you know, hands down, unless you have a really good eyewitness to give you good details and you're just kind of shooting fish in a barrel, that's a difficult task. That's a heavy lift. So during the canvas, uh, they did go to uh, Shirley's room and they talked to Shirley and Noah. So Shirley, I guess at that point, she reported to investigators, hey, um, my friend is missing. She left and never came back. So when they processed the room or they were looking through a room, they found you know, uh, the belongings for uh, Sophie, including her ID. So they were able to identify the body in the bathtub to be Sophie based on the ID from Shirley's room. Okay, so just so that I I can be clear. So investigators show up. The, the body is found by janitors. Janitors call police. Everybody shows up. And at that point, Shirley does not know that Sophie's been found. She yeah, just, I don't she know. She finds or, out when they come to her room. To that's the way I understand it. it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's there's a lot of information out there, and that's probably something that's been asked and answered. But from the court documents that I read, it's it's pretty vague. So I, you know, the way that I read it, I I'm assuming that she didn't know. And at that time, when they came and knocked on her door, they're like, "Oh, hey, wait, when you know, my friend's missing." So I hope this isn't the same thing. But okay. Um, either way, that's how police ended up identifying her was based on the ID inside Shirley's dormitory. Okay. Probably curious what the crime scene looks like, huh? Yes. When they investigated the crime scene, here's what they found. Sophie's body was inside the tub, laying on her back. Her legs were together. They're bent over kind of to the left. I'm picturing a fetal position here. Her feet were in contact with the bottom of the tub. She was wearing socks and shoes. Her pants and underwear were pulled down past her knees, and her sweater was pushed up around her neck and armpits. The right cup of her bra was pushed up, exposing her right breast. The left side of Sophie's face was laying against the bottom of the tub over the drain, and her arms were above her head below the water spigot. Okay, so no water in the tub at all. Dry. Well, it's interesting that you say that. So what they noticed was Sophie had multiple stab wounds on her face. They also noticed that her face was covered in dry blood, but... They took note that her hair and her clothing was damp. So they concluded that she might not have been killed inside the bathtub. They think she might have been placed there because the blood on her face was dry, yet her hair and her clothes were damp. Interesting. Okay. Right. As we continue, investigators believed um, that, you know, I guess, I mean, initially I'm thinking investigators believed that these stab wounds to her face might have been the cause of her death. But when they took her body out of the tub, what do you think they found? Any idea? I don't know. Well, first of all, they found a cigarette lighter in the drain underneath where her head was. Okay. But when they pulled her out and they looked at her, they found a single gunshot wound to the back of her head. Now, wow. I've, I kind of went back and forth with this. I'm thinking, wow, it's 1.30 in the morning. It's super quiet in the dorm room. Anybody could have heard a gunshot, Right. right? Well, I don't necessarily think that's the case because I've investigated some suicides and I'm going to do a little spoiler alert. They ended up doing the autopsy, found a 22 caliber bullet inside of her head. And in some of these suicides, they happen inside houses, you know, in in multi-living, you know, apartment complexes, even outside. And I've had people say, I didn't even hear the shot, but we knew that it happened. So it, it is possible that, you know, this shot rang out and nobody heard it because I don't think, well, there is one witness later that describes something that might have been the gunshot, but, um, you know, it didn't alarm anybody to come in there and immediately check the bathroom either. That's interesting. That's, that's pretty brazen because it's a dormitory filled with people. And although it's one thirty in the morning, anybody can come in that bathroom at any time. There's not like you lock it. It's 
right? It's right. Got, it's multiple stalls, multiple oh, yeah. showers. People can come and go as they please. A hundred percent. Interesting. And, okay. and so what I'm seeing when you mention those things, this brazen act, I'm thinking right away, this got to be like a crime of opportunity. I don't know that this is anybody that really knew her or you know, had a vendetta against her, although the stab wounds to her face, sometimes that's super personal. That's what I was going to point out. That is usually pretty personal. Actually, a stabbing in and of itself is pretty personal. And, right. and they shot her as well. So was it even necessary for them to stab her in the face in addition to shooting her? Well, it just you know, seems we'll, personal get, to me. we'll get into the medical examiner and what they believed as far as whether those stab wounds were, you know, bef- while she was alive or post-mortem. Um, and, and, and to refresh my memory, she did go to this school the year prior, yeah. so she oh, yeah. would have known people there. She, Yeah, she knew a lot of people there. Okay. She went out, uh, you know, remember she went to Murphy Dome right. to go hang out with her friends. She's, okay. you know, hanging out with Sophie and Noah. Yeah, she knows people there. Yeah, okay. Uh, but again, I don't know what the population of, the, or, you know, the population of this campus is, you know, during a school year, especially a spring semester like this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm guessing the best I can tell, this is at least a four story building. Um, so it's, it's probably pretty loaded with kids because, you know, they're doubling these students up into these dorm rooms. Um, who knows how many, you know, rooms are on each level, but it's, it's, you know, there's definitely a lot of people here. Okay. So through the investigation, a lot of people were interviewed, including a female witness by the name of Jennifer Roy. It's ROI, it might be WA, like, you know, Patrick WA, but I think it's Roy. Anyway, Jennifer said she was showering in a different bathroom at about 1.30 in the morning at the time of the murder. And I guess this bathroom is a separate bathroom um, from this main shower area that's on the second level, but it also shares a wall with the bathtub room. So she described when she was in there hearing thumping and muffled noises. Jennifer said it sounded like someone was being pushed up against the wall, and she also said it sounded like somebody fell down, followed by muffing noises, which led Jennifer to believe that there was more than one person in the tub room at that time. Crazy? Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of speechless. You don't even have to say. I just, I'm trying to imagine this. Yeah. It's kind of hard to imagine. (laughs) You know, there's several other witnesses um, that come forward later and, and say some things, which I guess, you know, it makes sense. I mean, it's been a long time since I've been in college, but I, I mean, I mean, if you're up partying and drinking or whatever on a Saturday night, it makes sense that kids would be up around one thirty in the morning. Right. Which is why I was saying it's so brazen because although it's one thirty in the morning, it's a college campus and kids are coming and going. It's a Saturday night, you know, right. I mean, this is the really chilling part though, that kind of stuck out with me. There was another witness. Her name was Vanessa Allen. She recalled showering at the time of Sophie's death. It doesn't say where she was showering, but I'm assuming it's in this connected tub room shower common area. She heard what she described as fireworks coming from the tub room. She also recalled seeing the light on in the tub room, which gave her a very uneasy feeling because she says that that light's never on. And so she kind of described, you know, she couldn't get out of there quick enough. She hurried up and she left. Now you're, when you, when you think about this, you're like, well, you heard fireworks and the lights on and you didn't bother to go check or report this. What's wrong with you? Well, Well, she was scared. It sounds like to me. Yeah. It sounds like it made her nervous. So. Oh, it probably did. And we're talking about young adults. This is their first time away from home. And, you know, I mean, you know better than anybody, we don't really know how people react in these stressful times. Everybody sure. has a different kind of a reaction. So on the 28th, well, they transported um, Sophie's body to the coroner's office in, in Anchorage, or medical examiner, and on the 28th, they performed a autopsy. The autopsy revealed Sophie was killed by the single gunshot wound to the back of her head. So that's what did her in. Uh, they recovered that bullet, which I told you it was a 22 caliber bullet. It was placed into evidence. The autopsy also revealed Sophie was stabbed two times in the right corner of her right eye. Crazy, right? Yeah. The medical examiner concluded Sophie was alive mm. when she was stabbed in the eye. I don't know what information they had that led them to believe that, but the, you know, medical examiners are always, you know, for the most part, they're pretty right on. Yeah. The autopsy revealed a third stab wound to Sophie's right cheek, but the medical examiner determined that that was most likely 
caused after she was already dead. So, sorry. This, that's awful for one. To, it is like, awful. To be stabbed in the eye while you're still alive. But I can't imagine that anything would be able to stop you from screaming just in pain or, or making some kind of noise. Sure. That, that would, I mean, people were showering in the same vicinity, it sounds like. I, it's just interesting that nobody heard any, I mean, there was muffled noises, according Fireworks. to- Fireworks. Yeah, but nothing like a scream. Yeah. Oh. I mean, there's a lot of really weird things about this case. Um, so additionally, you know, and this could be, this could mean anything. I, I'm not going to say that these are related to the case, to the case. They most likely are, but the autopsy also revealed that she had several abrasions and marks to her abdomen, her right hip and a bruise on her right knee. That could be part of the struggle. That could be a pre-existing one. We don't know. Mm. You know, a lot of people think that you can gauge time periods of when somebody was abused based on a bruise, but actually that's, that's a misconception. Everybody bruises different, right. and even your own body bruises different depending on a lot of different circumstances, environmental circumstances, you know, how hydrated you might be. So, you know, your, your bruises will always be a little bit different. So I don't know what that looked like, and I, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, two days later they did the autopsy, so who knows, you know, what this, you know, sure. bruise really looks like in the pictures at the crime scene, and I just don't have that information. During the autopsy, obviously... You know, I don't know what you think about when it comes to this crime. I mean, for me, whenever I see, you know, pants around the ankles or, you know, mm -hmm. pulled down and then a breast exposed, I immediately think sex assault. Right. But that's just because that's what I've done for so long. Well, I mean, yeah, I think anybody would think that if they saw that. So did they find that she had been sexually assaulted? Well, during the autopsy, they collected sli uh, swabs from her vagina and various other body parts. Um, I think one place that they took it was from her breast. Uh, you, but you have to remember, this is 1993. Right. DNA technology and analysis is not what it is today. It's in its infancy. It then. was in its infancy. Yeah. And in Alaska, in the late 90s, um, they just were barely starting to use DNA technology. It was very new to them. I mean, they weren't even using it in the 90s. It wasn't until the late 90s that they started using it, and then it was actually really new to them then. Wow. So because of this new technology in the 90s, uh, or in the late 90s, they were able to, ve to develop a DNA profile with some of the other, other evidence collected. So later on, though, this is in 93. So you're talking in the late 90s they were able to? So did this yes. go cold for a while? Yeah, it did. It went cold for a really long time. I mean, they okay. did their interviews and everything, but... Um, you know, in the late 90s, they were really starting to develop and use DNA technology in Alaska. Well, they did develop a DNA profile, but a DNA profile back then is different than what you might find today. You know, the technology just wasn't there. So with that DNA profile, they tested numerous poss possible suspects. I mean, they, you know, they probably had a lot of leads. They had interviewed witnesses. So all these suspects that they started testing it just all came to a dead end. They didn't have any resolution whatsoever from any of them. So then they turned their attention to the bullet recovered in her head. They learned, that's when they learned it was a 22 bullet. They started testing it. Um, you know, they could do ballistics and stuff, but without a weapon, they can't really connect it to any suspects. Um, essentially, when a, when a bullet leaves a gun, it has striation marks that are very particular. There's lands and landings and grooves, and there's just these different things that go into testing um, ballistics. It's almost like a fingerprint on yeah. a bullet. If you find the if you find the weapon right. that, that fired it, yes. So you can you can line those up, and they're able to determine that. But again, they don't have any suspects. DNA is not working out. They don't have any information to lead anybody to a weapon. But she, so she was sexually assaulted. Yes. So part of the court records actually say that they noticed that, like a, a white milky substance inside of her vagina. Cause remember when, when you're, when you, when you uh, are sexually assaulted um, and then murdered, you're not standing up. Gravity doesn't take that semen out of your vagina. It stays right. in you wherever, however your body lays. And so that's what they found. So yes, there was okay. the, eventually when they, when the DNA analysis got better, then they were able to basically put together a male YSTR uh, profile 
and they were able to say, okay, there's spermatozoa in this um, swab, and so they were able to basically figure out that this was male DNA. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that they probably thought it was all along, right? being that it's a white milky substance, but um, eventually they were able to put the DNA into what we call CODIS, and CODIS is the combined DNA identification system, and basically any time there is uh, DNA in, in a crime, it gets put into the CODIS database. Anytime somebody's convicted of a felony, their DNA is collected, it's put in a coded, CODIS database. Now, what does that do? Well, a CODIS database, if we have a crime where there's an unknown suspect, but there's DNA, if his DNA or her DNA is inside of the CODIS database and you upload that unknown profile, it basic CODIS basically analyzes that every single day, multiple times a day, mm, wow. trying to find a match. And then it's super quick. When a match happens, you get notified and then you get to work, right? Right. So they put the unknown DNA into the CODIS database and it checked every day, but no identification was ever mm. made. So what does that mean? It means that the, the suspect never did anything else to have his DNA put in CODIS. Right. As time passed, investigators continued to follow leads and t tested potential suspects for DNA, but they just eliminated suspects because nothing was matching up. In 2003, this is you know 10 years later, Sophie's case was cold again. From 2003 until 2009, it was revisited by various detectives, but nobody could solve the case. It was eventually taken over by an investigator uh, who worked for the Alaska State Troopers by the name of James Stog Stogsdill. J uh, James was the investigator assigned to this case. He kind of reviewed everything, and in his investigation, he interviewed a guy by the name of Nicholas Dazer. Now... Nick was living in the dorms at the time of the crime. He lived in um, room 305 with his roommate, Stephen Downs. Both Nick and Stephen were interviewed during the initial investigation, but they both denied having any knowledge of the murder. At the time of the murder, Nick was a student at the university, and he was also working as a security guard for the university. Mm. On the night of the murder, Nick was on duty. Crazy, right? On the 26th, Nick helped out with the police by securing the crime scene to oh, make sure wow. nobody came in there. Hmm. This is, I, I, it just gets know crazy, where right? Where my mind is going. Where's your that? mind going? I mean, he had full access to, to the crime scene and during the entire thing because he was a security guard. It's sure did. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Detective Stogsdill chose to re interview Nick after learning Nick was fired from the university mm. for possessing a firearm, which is not permitted on the dorms. And when was that? When was he fired? I don't know when he was fired, okay. but it had to be after this because remember, he's acting as a security guard. Right. Protecting the scene, probably just until police get there. I don't think that, you know, they're like, hey, security guard, yeah, you right. seem like a good guy. Watch this right. while we interview people. It's not like that. Right. But he, you know, he had access to that entire area so yeah so during the interview with Nick he denied owning a 22 caliber gun but check this out Nick told detective Stogsdall his roommate Steven owned a 22 caliber handgun mm -hmm. and the handgun was inside their room in 1993 wow well, yeah but Nick said Steven owned several other guns as well uh, he recalled the 22 caliber handgun was an H&R revolver. According to firearms expert Deborah Gillis, the ballistic information from the bullet recovered from Sophie's head would be consistent with being fired from an H&R 22 caliber revol revolver. But Deborah also concluded the ballistic information is also consistent with a large number of other 22 caliber firearms. Right. So it just included it. It didn't exclude everything else. It didn't say this is specific to the, an H&R revolver, they, they really didn't have anything else, right? It's just mm -hmm. kind of a, a lead, an investigative lead at this point. So given that there was no more information to solve the case, Sophie's case went cold again. That is until investigator Randy McFernan picked it up in 2018. Now, I'm not good at math. 93 to 2018, that's a long time. It's 25 years. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, Investigator McFernan took over the case and decided to take a different approach. Do you know what approach he took? Do you have any idea? I don't. I get really excited about I know. This. I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing about it. I know you've heard about genetic genealogy. I That's have. the approach that he took. Um, I do get excited about this because um, I've worked with crime analysts. I've heard presentations on genetic genealogy, and it's, it's quite amazing. It and really so, is. Oh, that's how they caught the Golden State that's killer. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I've heard quite a few stories of some cold cases that would have never been solved mm -hmm. had it not been for genetic Absolutely. genealogy. So genetic genealogy, it's an interesting process. Essentially, they upload the unknown DNA profile, which they had in this case, um, into genealogical databases to find a common DNA profile found in relatives who use those databases, right? Because most of the time they're using these databases to connect with family, um, try to build their family tree, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, some of these databases, you have, you, know, you have to opt in, but people opt in to allow law enforcement to use their DNA to solve cases. Well, apparently that's the case here because in this case, um, they used a forensic genealogist to to basically come up with something. It's pretty exciting. So the database is only used to help forensic genealogists identify relatives. That's all it is. You know, it doesn't do anything else other than identify these relatives. Once they have identi uh, relatives identified, then it's just a grueling, painstaking investigative process where they have to start going back using different research methods to kind of narrow their search. They call it cutting off branches. So if they have a partial match on a DNA profile and they're going down this road of these people, they can start using, you know, uh, death records, birth records. You know, if it's a male, uh, you know, profile, for example, and then, you know, they're related to this one person, but that person only had, you know, daughters. Well, then right. they can cut that branch off and look somewhere else. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so, so they start looking into this. Um, in this case, the unknown D DNA profile was compared to DNA profiles of people who voluntarily submitted their DNA into the public database, and through an in-depth process of elimination, investigators were able to develop an investigative lead identifying a possible suspect. You want to take a guess? Mm -hmm. I'm really uh, interested to hear your thoughts. I don't know. I do mean, you, do I, you want to I, dissect this a little bit before sure. we tell you? I okay, yeah. So I mean, obviously, I'm leaning toward. The, the two males that okay. lived in the dorm on the third floor, the, sec the security guard and his roommate. Okay, why? Well, because they had a twenty two revolver okay. in their room. Okay. I mean, it was owned by the roommate, but that doesn't mean that the security guard didn't have access to it. Right. The security guard had access to that entire dormitory. Nobody would have thought twice to see a male security guard walking around in the halls because he's just doing his job. He's making sure that everybody is safe. That's so a good observation. I mean, it's not, I mean, if you maybe, I mean, I don't know that it would have brought attention to anyone to see a male. It sounds like the males and females could kind of visit each other. So maybe they, it wouldn't have, you know, been so bizarre. But, right. Exactly. But especially, I don't, I really don't think it's going to bring attention if it's somebody dressed in a security uniform. That's yeah, that's a really good that's, observation. When I was doing the research on this, thought, that thought never crossed my mind. Yeah. So um, but I, I actually kind of knew the outcome before I started digging, so that's why. Huh. But I I mean, I give you props cuz I might not have thought about that. But yeah. you're right. I mean, you see a it's security not guard bring attention and, to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have know, ac you have access to the crime scene. You have access to a weapon. Um and then I mean, when her body is discovered, the police invest start investigating, you're kind of there with them. So you can kind of, I don't know, hear have what... Have an insight, have an like insight. Dexter, right? Yeah, exactly. You're hearing where they think the case is going, what suspects they might have, because you're, you know, keeping the, you know, the scene secure until they get there. And like, you're listening and you're, you're an active part in that's, that initial investigation, I guess. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, and that's a good thought, but... I guess, let me ask you this then, if the security guard did it, and we know that the weapon is a twenty two, why would he turn the police's attention, investigators' attention to his roommate who had a twenty two mm. if he did it? That's true, because he could have just not said anything about the gun. Could correct? have just not said anything. Yes. Or he could have said, hey, my roommate has a twenty two, 
and kind of left out the part that he also has a 22. Right. But, yeah. well, he couldn't have left out that he has a 22 because he was fired for owning that. The, the detective well, already knew that, right? He was fired for possessing a gun. It never says... Oh, it didn't say what kind. Yeah. I can't find what kind of gun he, he owned. Okay. But, you know, the only other thing that he said was, hey, Stephen owns a bunch of other guns. Right. Because so. they're like, hey, you were fired for possessing a firearm and a firearm was used in this crime. So he immediately is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. My roommate also had guns. He had, you know, tons of them, including a twenty two revolver. So Right. And I think it was a lot different in 93 uh, as far as bringing guns onto a campus. Than oh, it I'm is sure. Today. Uh, so, it, you know, yeah, it's against school policy, but, you know, is that enough for the cops to really back then get a warrant if they knew about it back then? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, we're talking 25 years later. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. I mean, that's what they call, you know, dormant. It's, it's dormant. It's cold. There's no urgency that I mean anything could happen he could have got rid of it got a new gun so right. they wouldn't be getting a warrant now to go look for a 22 that he had 25 years ago right right okay so here it is the dna came back to stephen downs aunt so okay and stephen downs was the roommate right stephen downs was the roommate okay um he was born august 31st 1974 it's important to point out um that he did attend the same uh, college. Um, he graduated, well, he's actually from Maine. He graduated high school in Maine in June of 92. And then after he graduated high school, he left Maine, moved to Fairbanks, Alaska, where he attended University of Alaska Fairbanks in the fall of 92. He attended the university from 92 until 96. So he stayed mm -hmm. there after this crime happened for several years. Mm -hmm. We already know he was attending that school. Uh, we already know that he, you know, was living with Nick in the same building where Sophie was sexually assaulted and murdered. So what what do investigators do with this at this point? Well, do it's they, not, sorry, do they know, did Sophie and him, they, did they know each other at all? I'll get to that. To, okay. Yeah. You're, you're way ahead all of me, right, but I'll, I'll get to that. So what do they do with this information? Now, all they have is a partial match for the, the unknown DNA um, found on Sophie's body and it matches to his aunt, partially matches to his aunt. So they know that they're a relative. Well, they, they followed a couple different leads with a grandmother and different things, but they were able to cut those branches off and follow that down to Stephen Downs as being the, the suspect who they believe what it is. So, so in genetic genealogy, you can't use the, uh, you can't use this information as probable cause to just go out and arrest him. That's not how it works. Okay. What they have to do is treat this as an investigative lead and say, okay, now we're looking at Stephen Downs. Now we have to go try to get his DNA so that we actually have his DNA and then we can test it against the unknown DNA found on Sophie. So um, before we get to that, though, uh, you know, it's, it's important to understand um, kind of why this, why this happened and why they, you know, what they have to do next. I mean, typically when these things happen, you, you, when you have to go try to get that unknown DNA or that known DNA from that person, you want to do it without tipping them off. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's kind of how these cases work. So, you know, they might follow him to Starbucks, for example, and just take his cup and now they have his DNA from where he was drinking right. or, you know, look through his garbage. And that's what they did. They spent months in Maine looking and tracking and they just couldn't so now get anything. He's back him. in Maine now after all these years. Correct. They tracked him down. Okay. Yep. He in in fact he was living in Auburn, May, where he was employed as a nurse. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm I was wondering what he's up to all these years well, later. They checked his criminal history. He had never had any arrests. Um his DNA was obviously never uploaded into CODIS or this would have been solved a lot quicker. Um and you know they they spent all this time trying to develop his DNA off of, you know, trash and different things, but they never could. So eventually they just decided we're going to go knock on Steven's door and talk to him. So that's what they call a knock and talk, right? So they went in, uh, on February 13th of 2019, Maine state police and Alaska state troopers contacted Steven at home in Maine. When Steven was interviewed, he recalled seeing the mur the female that was murdered in the dorm. He, um, not personally, but he remembered it. Um, he said that he didn't know who she was and denied ever having any contact with her. Hmm. When he was shown a picture of Sophie, 
Stephen told investigators that he recognized her from the posters that he saw around around the time of the murder, but he denied having any personal knowledge of her or any contact with her. Stephen said he lived on the third floor of the dorm building, but he told investigators that he spent most of the time on the fourth floor with his girlfriend. Stephen also told investigators his girlfriend's room, he was in the girlfriend's room on the night of the murder, and um, he believed, he theorized, that Sophie was murdered by some soldiers um, because there's a nearby uh, military base called Fort Wainwright. Um, so he, that's what he told them. He says, I think it was these soldiers. These soldiers are always in, in and out of the dorm rooms. And so that, that's got to be your guy. Right. And so before leaving, uh, investigators showed Stephen a picture of Sophie and quoted Stephen as saying, I remember the picture. It's terrible. Poor girl. But once again, he told the investigators that he didn't know her and he didn't have any contact with her. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, uh, he his DNA is on her, so you can't say that. Right. I mean, he I mean, he could have said, "Oh, well, yeah, we had consensual sex or whatever prior to, well, and that could explain that." But now that he's saying, "Whoa, I've never even met her, don't know her at all. Why is your DNA inside of her vagina then?" Right. And I actually, I'm giving these investigators huge props for this. this is a great move on their part because they could have came in and they'd have been like, hey, we got DNA, we'd right. like your DNA. And now he's going to formulate his story by saying, oh, well, I had a consensual sexual exactly. relationship with her. And so I don't know who killed her, but I was afraid to come forward, whatever. And then the case is going to go cold again because all you have is now evidence of sex. Right. You don't actually have evidence of a, a sex assault. Because a lot of people think, and actually it came up in this trial, uh, a lot of people think that during a sex assault, you're going to have, you know, trauma to the vagina or the mouth or, you know, whatever was violated. And that's just not the case. You can have trauma to any of those body parts during a consensual sexual encounter. And conversely, you can have a sex assault where there's no injuries whatsoever. Um, it just depends on really what happened and what that act was. Um, so, like I said, I give these investigators props because they just went in and they're like, hey, we're just here following up. Do you know anything about this? And right away locked him into his story. I don't know her, never had contact with her. Meanwhile, in their head, they're thinking, all right, buddy, you're going to have to explain why your DNA is inside of her. If you've if never, you've had never contact even met with her. her. Yeah. So, so anyway, that was, that was a good, I just have to give them shout out. Cause that's yeah, pretty absolutely. cool. They then got a warrant, a search warrant and executed the search warrant on Stephen's house. And the investigators collected buccal swabs from Steve, Stephen. So, um, a buccal swab is basically just a Q-tip that goes inside your cheek and it's just collecting, you know, skin cells and DNA from inside your mouth so that it can then be tested. I don't know this for a fact, but what I'm reading into this is when they go, had he said it was a consensual, I've had consensual sex with her. They'd have never got a search warrant for his DNA. Right. Um, maybe they would have, but highly unlikely. The fact that they have DNA that is closely related to Steven and he's saying, I never had any contact with her. I'm guessing that's how they were able to establish probable cause to collect his DNA. So they do, they collect it. I mean, you know where this is going. They tested it. They actually rush tested it through the help of uh, Maine's laboratories because they didn't want him to run off. So they did a rush on him. I mean, it was an immediate test and an immediate match. So his DNA was inside of her that entire time. So they arrested him um, for the assault and murder of Sophie. But it kind of doesn't really even stop there. I mean, I when I looked at this, I truly believe that he's guilty of this. I mean, the evidence tells us that it is. Oh, yeah. But there's some crazy things that came out in the trial. Well... Remember, the DNA is the only thing connecting Stephen to this crime. Yeah, because he never it. found the gun. No. Mm. So apparently other evidence was collected during this investigation, such as fingerprints, blood, boot prints, fibers, none of which point to Stephen, but none of that stuff points to any other suspects either. Hmm. So anyway... Defense argued it was possible Stephen had a consensual relationship with Sophie prior to the murder, but remember, we just talked about this. He denied knowing her or having any contact with her before he even knew that the police had DNA evidence. So you remember Shirley? The yes, friend that the friend. Sophie was staying with? Uh-huh. 
At trial, Shirley testified to seeing two male students and one female when she entered the stairwell. I'm guessing this is when she left with Noah at some point during the night to to go to Noah's apartment. I don't know when, but she saw this these three people in the stairwell. Okay. Shirley identified one of the males as Stephen and recalled Stephen was wearing a white t-shirt. Another witness by the name of Melanie Sagunik testified she saw a man coming out of the shower and bathtub area of the woman's bathroom around 1.30 a.m. on the 26th. Okay. Melanie said she was washing her hands in the sink in that bathroom when the man wearing a paisley gray collared shirt entered the sink area from the tub and shower area before he exited the bathroom. Melanie described that man as five foot eight inches with black hair and dark complexion. The defense pointed out that Stephen's six foot two with brownish blonde hair and he's light skinned. Now, what is this? I don't know what he looked like back then, but if you look at him now, he is a very heavy man. He's okay. put on a ton of weight. I mean, I, I think I would guess between three and 400 pounds. Oh, wow. Easy. Okay. Oh, is that what you're going to ask? Yeah. Melanie was shown a, at a, a photo lineup and she picked two men out of the lineup that she said kind of resembled the guy in the bathroom. She didn't positively identify either one, but she said, hey, these, these two guys look similar to the guy that I and saw. And this is 25 years later when she's yeah. being asked this. Okay. Right. Um, one of those men out of the two she picked was their, one of their initial alternate suspects whose name is Kenneth Moto. Ken was the main suspect early on in this investigation, and when he was interviewed the day after the murder uh, by the lead investigator, Ken was wearing a gray shirt. Mm. Apparently... Ken's sister, at one point in time, I don't know when, told investigators that Ken confessed to her to killing Sophie, but Ken's sister died before the trial happened, so she couldn't testify to that admission. When Ken was asked about the confession to his sister, he explained that uh, he and his sister were watching a TV show, true crime show, about Sophie's cold case, and he told his sister that he was a suspect in the case. Mm. That was what he, that was how he justified what, you know, she told investigators. Okay. So another witness, his name is Michael Leak. Michael testified that his roommate Gregory Thornton owned a 22 caliber H&R revolver as well, which Greg kept hidden in their room on the fifth floor of Bartlett Hall. So now we're talking five floors. So it's wow. a pretty big dormitory. But anyway, Michael said he saw Greg on a daily basis until approximately one or two days before the murder, and he never saw Greg again. The weird thing, though, Mike recalled seeing uh, you know, uh, seeing Greg prior to you know those two days, but mm -hmm. Greg had arranged a ride home with one of Mike's friends because Greg didn't have any money, but Greg never showed up for that ride home. Well, where did he go? He just I left school and never came back? Just left school and never came back. And so okay. that's the interesting thing because I'm not saying that Stephen is innocent by any means, but the curious thing is people like Greg just disappear after a crime whereas Stephen stays for four more years for four more years mm -hmm. as a student. Um, so, I mean, that's really the case. And in February of 2022, Stephen was found guilty of Sophie's murder. He was also found guilty of the sex assault. In September of 2022, the judge sentenced Stephen using the sentencing laws that were in place in 1993. They're much different than today. I don't know what that difference is. I didn't research that, but he was sentenced to 67 years for the murder conviction and eight years for the sex assault conviction. The judge ordered that these sentences be served consecutively, meaning one right after the other. Uh, so he was ultimately sentenced to uh, 75 years. I know that the defense kind of argued that, hey, a 75-year sentence is harsh because, you know, he's overweight. He's not going to live to be 100 years old. You know, he might not make it that long. Uh, so he's going to basically die in prison. Well, either way, that's what he was sentenced to. Um, in Alaska, apparently, he's eligible to uh, parole basically after serving 25 of those years, uh, at which point he will be 73 years old if he serves 75. Um, additionally, the judge ordered that Stephen has to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. But that story didn't stop there. In October of last year, 2022, Stephen filed an appeal for his conviction sentence, and, or his conviction and sentence, and um, he still maintains his innocence to this day. Yeah, so he's never... He's never, never admitted, admitted to it. guilt. Okay. And, um, so that he's never come up with an explanation of why his DNA was there? No. he. Just, uh, if you listen to his interview, you could find tons of audio clips on this online. Um, essentially what he said is, 
I don't know. It's just some misunderstanding. I don't know how this happened. I've never hurt anybody in my entire life. I'm a nurse. I'm here to help people, not hurt people. Um, you know, that the investigators did their research and apparently in Maine there, you know, he got in a little bit of trouble with the state licensing place because somebody filed a complaint. A couple women said that they made him feel, made them feel weird, mm. um, things of that nature. And he was given some kind of disciplinary thing, but I mean, you know, that's all, you know, hypothetical stuff that might be relevant, might not. I mean, maybe he just has some weird behaviors. I don't know. The thing that I can't get past though is He's saying, I don't know her, never had contact with right. her, but my semen is inside Yeah, of her. and his explanation is, oh, this is a misunderstanding. You can't misunderstand DNA. A, a seminal fluid inside of a, someone's vagina, that's not a misunderstanding. You had contact with her. Right. At some point. And, you know, not that this has ever been a defense, but I mean, how are you going to explain that being there if you didn't put it there yourself? I mean, it's well, not like yeah. Greg somebody knows collected you it and collected your semen and then you know planted it. That's right. it's not like that happened, and it's not like these tests are wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, these are this is evidence based. You know, I mean, it's DNA. It's it's not wrong. Right. You know, my I mean, DNA is way different than yours. Exactly, and it was. I mean, they went through a whole process with it. It it matched his family members. You know, they had to go down the family tree to find him. So, right. I mean, he was definitely there. My question is, and you can tell me what you think. Do you think there were multiple people involved in that? Because I it thought almost about sounds that, like it to me. And it is possible that there's multiple people. Um, so, but the, but the problem is, you know, Stephen never admitted to anything and didn't really cooperate. Right. You know, it, it, as far as a confession anyway. So I, I don't know that that is a thing. I mean, it makes sense to me. That's a good theory. So I, and I'm just throwing this out there. So Sophie sees two males and a female in a stairwell as she's leaving with Noah to go to his, his dorm room. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, this crime was extremely personal. You right. don't you don't stab people in the eye, especially when they're still alive, mm -hmm. unless there's a personal thing. Like you you shot her. There there's no need to then stab her, someone in the face of all things. That's not trying to kill them. That's just torturing them, really. So do you, so. My thought is, is it possible? Because uh, Stephen Stephen had a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it possible Stephen was like liking Sophie? Girlfriend got jealous, said, "Hey, I mean, and 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 then the three these two guys and her go and commit this crime." That I mean, that's a possibility. They, you know, um, the roommate saw, um, like saw maybe them in the in the stairwell. Maybe Sophie did have consensual sex with Stephen. Some sometime in that 24 hours prior to, girlfriend found out, girlfriend's pissed and says the only way you can make this right, you know, this is the only way to make this right. Yeah, and then I, is that like too possible. way I think out that's in kind left of way field? Out. Yeah, I think that's kind of way out in left field only because 25 years later when the investigators come and they're, they start talking to him, he's going to tell him, okay, you know, I didn't want to say this then because, you know, my my girlfriend at the time and I, I didn't want to cause any problems, whatever. Um, no, I don't think he would. I don't think he would even say that then because he still wants to distance himself from he he wants nothing to do with that. Because because even if he says, well, you know, this is why it still puts him yeah. there. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. I don't know. That's just I, where my mind. I, I yeah, I see what you're saying. I would reject that only only on the basis of. You got three people committing a crime, a heinous crime like that. Somebody's going to talk. That's my experience. Yeah, I mean, eventually somebody's going to get nervous and talk. Things happen. Um, I mean, it, it is a good theory. Uh, the other, the other thing is though, you know, defense really put a whole lot of weight on on this guy with the gray shirt that was interviewed the next right. day. I don't think that's the same guy because the witness clearly, uh, you know, remembered a paisley collared shirt. That's different than a gray shirt. A I don't know if it's the same thing or not, but when you're stabbing somebody and there's a gunshot and there's obvious blood evidence inside the crime scene, you're probably going to have that blood on the yeah. on your head, on your on your clothes. So my theory and where my mind goes is that doesn't mean anything just because he's wearing a gray shirt means he's involved. No. What I think is 
when Shirley saw uh, Stephen in the stairwell, he's wearing a white T-shirt. A lot of people wear, you know, a button up or a collared gray shirt might have had blood evidence on it. He would take that off and be wearing something else or mm-hmm. maybe the shirt that was underneath. So okay. I don't really put a whole lot of weight into those witness statements of, um, you know, it was a gray shirt versus Stephen wearing a white shirt in the stairwell. Right. It's just it's just interesting that it was right around the time, one thirty in the morning. She's washing her hands. He He comes out of that room and washes his hands like yeah and i do know that and i just read this and i don't remember where i saw this but i do know that the defense kind of questioned her on it and they said hey you saw a six foot two you know darker complected person and she she i guess she explained well you know basically where i'm from you know and remember there's i don't know you know anything about her but that you know there's a, a huge native american demographic in alaska she explains, well, dark complected and light complected means something different to me than the regular population. That's, okay. that's essentially how she explained that off. Um, but I don't also, I don't really think that she identified Stephen as the person that came out either. I mean, surely she would have had to been asked that. I just don't know what that, what that answer is. All good information to, you know, get an appeal. I mean, the yeah. judge has already, um, basically uh, ruled on one of his appeals, which is he, you know, is gets to fire his old attorney and he gets now a public defender. I mean, they had to review his indigency. And so, so now he has a public defender, but we don't know yet where that appeal process is or where it's going. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a fascinating case just because, I mean, clearly you have DNA evidence from somebody that says they didn't even know this person. So clearly he was involved Yeah. with her at some point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but all that, I mean, it, all it really proves if you're looking at an appeals process is that he had sexual contact with her at some point. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I, where I, Stephen messed up was, um, he said, I don't know her and didn't. I didn't have contact with her when yeah. he knew that was a lie one right. way or the other, whether it was consensual, which I don't think it was, I think he did it. Mm-hmm. Um, or whether it was, you know, the assault. Either way, he lied to investigators. So when I look at this and I start talking about um, interviews and interrogations, I already know he lied to me once. So when he claims that he's innocent and he's only here to help people, I would also look at that as a lie. I question what everybody says, and I would say that would be my thing. Man, you you already lied about it one time. What makes you know? Why should I believe you now? Right. Yeah. It's just. I mean, it, the whole thing is just kind of crazy, and then. To me, another weird thing is is it almost seems sadistic what the what whoever did to her face. Right. Right? Yeah. And then he's never done that ever again. Usually that like people that do those types of things, it's like a pattern for them and they will reoffend. Right. But... And I, one thing that we do know now is after all of this, his DNA was uploaded into CODIS. And mm-hmm. we already knew from beforehand cuz the unknown profile was uploaded to CODIS. It's definitely in there. It's definitely tied to him. Oh, for sure. If anything else comes up on a cold case, I mean, it's going to be pretty easy to figure out if he's done this. Again. Right. Well, that's just true. because his, his DNA wasn't in the system before. Right. It doesn't mean that he hadn't. It just means he hadn't been caught. Yeah. And that was one of the points that the defense brought up is, um, you know, he's, he's a model citizen. He's devoted his life to helping people. He, he wouldn't hurt anybody. I mean, obviously, except for Sophie. And um, he's gone this whole time, 25 years without being arrested, without a record. Okay, cool, man. But to me, that just means you never got caught. Exactly. You never got caught. Doesn't mean you're not a. Right. You know, doesn't mean you're a good guy. He definitely was involved. I just just personally wonder if there was more to it. Like, more, there's more people involved, or I don't know. Yeah. And I would love to hear the detectives Kate, uh, take on that. Yeah. Because well, because obviously they know the inner workings of this more than we do. I mean, you did a lot of research on it. Absolutely. But the detectives who actually worked it, they know like way more than right. what and we could find out. Who knows? Maybe we'll do a follow up on this after there's an appeal. We'll see. Maybe yeah. he'll win. I don't know. I doubt it. I really do think that he did it. I think he's responsible whether or not there's a second or third person, probably not a third, maybe a second. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it was Nick. Maybe Nick helped him. I right. don't know. Yeah. 
Um, you know, they seemed to be buddies. They were roommates. Um, sure, certainly knew a lot about his guns and, right. and different things. Um, you know, and there's a whole lot more to it, too. You know, you can go, you know, Google uh, Sophie's name and, and, and you can find just about anything in there. There's one reporter that I would love to give all the kudos to. She covered this story. Her name is Robin. I can't find her last name anywhere, hmm. um, but she's Robin from Alaska and she works for a local station up there and she covered this. She actually got permission because they did the trial in 2020 at the height of COVID. So they weren't allowing public in to, to do this. Mm -hmm. And it was the only trial that was going on at the time. So it was pretty, pretty widely known there in Fairbanks. Uh, but Robin got prior permission because they streamed it to record it and to basically put her story together. So she's, she has phenomenal um, recordings from the, uh, you know, people testifying in court, um, different things of that nature. She did a phenomenal job covering this and, and all credit to her. I wouldn't have known half of this stuff if it weren't for her. Um, the other thing is you could, you could easily find the charging document that was put together by the attorney general's office. And, uh, it has all the information that we've talked about here. Wow. Well, good job researching it. That was, I, I had never heard of that case. Yeah. yeah. So um, here we are. So if you want to talk now a little bit about the victims, I, I would love to hear your take on what they must have gone through in 25 years, having no closure, having no leads. And then, I mean, it had to have been an emotional roller coaster for these people because a new investigator would be assigned and they'd find a lead and it would just be a dead end. Yeah. So um, I don't know the case, obviously. So I don't know. Um, you know, Sophie's family. Did she have siblings? I don't know. You know, yeah, she had, she had a brother. Okay. Um, and actually Sophie wanted to join the military like he did. Um, and he does, you know, he does speak and stuff. Uh, from what, from what I can tell, a lot of these family members couldn't even attend the trial or even the sentencing because a lot of them were, were remote and trying to you know, call in to give victim impact statements okay. and things of that nature. Yeah, so. especially being in Alaska, it is such a, a vast state and it's very rural and people live way, way out. Right. And it's, you know, they have to fly into places. Sure. It's, so it's not easy. Um, so, you, you know, you ha they had to work with that also. Um, but I imagine, you know, for her brother, her mom and dad, um, you know, the initial shock of that happening all she was doing was going to a dentist appointment and right. she never came back. I mean, that's heartbreaking for one. It, it's, it's heartbreaking. I'm sure to, to lose a child anyway, but when it was so brutal, her last moments, she, she was traumatized and tortured in a way and, and then sexually assaulted. I mean, to imagine your loved one going through that, th that's absolutely horrific. And then not to have any answers, for several years and then you're right you go through and the late 90s you get your hopes up because they're able to put a profile together from the dna that was found and you get your hopes up like this is it this, this is dna this is like the new thing and they're solving all these cases with it and we're gonna finally have answers and nothing and so you hit that 10-year mark it's 2003 and you still don't know who did this who's responsible um I mean, that's absolutely traumatizing. And then, you know, you keep, they keep pushing forward. You know, they've, you've got different investigators on the case. Um, you know, you get your hopes up and then they get dashed because yes, they have this DNA profile. They upload it to CODIS, no match. I mean, so I imagine that it's just a lot of ups and downs for the family and, you know, every everybody processes things differently. Um, everybody grieves differently. Um, and I don't know if her parents were even still around 25 years later to see this conviction. I, I don't know, because I don't know those details. But I, I I just, my heart goes out to them. That's, that's super that's tragic. Really terrible. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's wrap this one up. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Mysteries and Moses. Cheers.